Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to a special colloquium today in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Professor Chet Moritz, who's from the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Physiology, and Biophysics. Um, Chet is a UW uh, undergraduate alum in our honors program. He then went on to receive a PhD in integrative uh, biology from UC Berkeley, followed by a postdoc at the University of Colorado, and another postdoc here at the University of Washington in physiology and biophysics. And that began his interest in uh, brain computer interfaces and uh, neuroprosthetic technology to treat paralysis. He's now an associate professor in the departments of rehabilitation, medicine, physiology, and biophysics, and he has an adjunct appointment in our own department of electrical engineering. Um, his work has been selected as one of the top scientific advancements of 2008 by the editors of Nature. He's the recipient of an NIH Eureka Award in 2009 and the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2012. Um, he was also uh, recently named an Allen Distinguished Investigator, and he uh, serves many of us in the UW community as Deputy Director of the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering. So it's a pleasure to welcome Chet. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us. All right, thanks, Matt, for the kind introduction. Everybody hear me in the back? Um, so I'm looking forward to telling you about our um, research developing and testing bio devices to improve function after spinal cord injury or brain injury such as stroke. And towards the end of the talk, we'll allude to some of the uh, other applications such as bladder control uh, that we've also begun to work on. One of the primary goals of the research in my lab is to restore function after paralysis, in this example due to spinal cord injury. And within that goal, we have two uh, broad aims. One is to directly reanimate the limb or cause movement of the hand and arm in someone who's had a complete injury to the spinal cord, otherwise can't move that hand and arm. And the second aim is to promote long-term recovery or regeneration, if you will, of either the residual um, tracks within the spinal cord or comp compensatory function. And so this goal here of promoting sustained recovery through the use of bio devices, uh, leveraging neuroplasticity. Most of the talk today will focus on our efforts to develop what we call a brain-controlled spinal interface, or BCSI for short, and that's diagrammed here, where we uh, extract the intention to move from recordings within the brain, route those signals through either um, a small custom electronic device or standard laboratory equipment, and use that to stimulate the spinal cord below the injury, effectively bridging the injury and allowing users to um, restore movement to their paralyzed arm. We'll show you an initial demonstration in our animal models that such an approach is possible. And we'll talk about some of the ongoing challenges. We'll use this diagram as a roadmap for the four sections of the talk today. The first outlines uh, our example back in 2008 that Matt mentioned of using brain activity to control stimulation of muscles, paralyzed muscles, using a technique uh, termed functional electrical stimulation. We showed that it was possible to extract the intention to move from a non-human primate, uh, and that he could therefore reanimate or restore movement to an otherwise paralyzed wrist. In the next portion of the talk, we'll talk about why we've since moved our stimulating electrodes from the muscles to the spinal cord below the level of the injury. There's a lot of advantages of stimulating within the spinal cord, in terms of activating functional synergies and reducing fatigue. And so there's several reasons why uh, we're excited about this approach. Another reason we're excited about stimulating within the spinal cord is that we've observed persistent improvements in function even after a period of spinal stimulation. So this idea that spinal stimulation could promote rehabilitation or be therapeutic and have benefits that, that outlast the stimulation. And we'll show you some initial examples of that. And then in the final few minutes of the talk, we'll talk about some of the future directions for our work, uh, looking at transitioning some of these technologies to human trials. One is in the, in the planning stages, uh, and some of the other work broadening uh, our applications beyond hand and arm movement to things like bladder control or interfacing with other uh, visceral nerves. So we'll begin with this concept of using brain activity to stimulate the muscles, and perhaps the ultimate goal of a brain-computer interface is shown schematically here the idea of developing a fully implantable system that could extract the intention from the user's brain using electrodes implanted within or on the surface of the brain. 
transmit that activity, uh, either wirelessly or here thrown shoe at, uh, shown with an external uh, pack, to coordinate the timing of stimulation delivered to an otherwise paralyzed muscle and restore the user's ability to reach, grasp, feed themselves, perform other activities of daily living. There's been many examples uh, in the media recently of brain-computer interfaces. I show two here playing simultaneously, the top one from the Donahue group at Brown University, the bottom one from Andy Schwartz's group at Pittsburgh. Both of these women have complete paralysis uh, from the neck down, either due to brainstem stroke in the top example or spinal cerebellar degeneration in the bottom example. They've been implanted with Utah rays. You can see the external um, uh, controlling, uh, excuse me, the external amplifiers on the head cap there. And each of them is controlling this robotic arm in real time uh, through the decoding of their intention to move. Slightly closer to home, we have an example here from Jeff Ogeman and Raj Rao, uh, where they're recording not from electrodes that penetrate the brain in this case, but from electrocorticography, termed ECOG, in this case a microgrid placed on the surface of the brain these subjects are undergoing surgery for epilepsy, and during that time, they can be asked to either make movements or imagine movements. Here, they're actually create, uh, causing movements of their hand, being captured by a data glove, and what you should notice are distinct patterns in the electrocorticography signal when different digits are moved. And Raj and Jeff and his team uh, have been able to decode both grasp synergies as well as individual digit movements from these recordings. So all of these examples provide the framework for our goal of using these brain activity uh, to restore movement to paralyzed limbs. If you conduct a survey and ask people with quadriplegia, or now the term is tetraplegia, paralysis of all four limbs, what their highest treatment priority is, it's regaining function of their own hand and arm, fivefold higher than any of the other functions in this survey. And so our goal was to merge the fields of brain-computer interfaces with the existing practice of functional electrical stimulation, or FES, and use brain signals to directly control stimulation of paralyzed muscles. Of course, FES has a long history, over 40 years, of uh, work in both uh, non-human um, animals as well as animal subjects. Howard Chizik has done many of the studies uh, using stimulation of muscles uh, to promote locomotion. And one of his colleagues when he was at Case Western is Hunter Peckham, and Hunter Peckham has developed a device they call the freehand system. It allows users to open or close the hand, one or two grasp synergies, uh, by using a shoulder switch mounted on the opposite shoulder. It's implanted in over 300 people and quite effective for people who have lower levels of spinal cord injury. So the shoulders are still able to move the elbow, but they're unable to grasp with the hand. So we're really building on uh, the work that's gone before in terms of brain-computer interfaces and functional electrical stimulation and merging the two. To conduct this study, our first task was to train a non-human primate, to train a macaque monkey, um, to perform movements of the wrist so that we could extract the intention to move from uh, electrodes, in this case, implanted within the brain. And so the first video I'll show you uh, is insight into what the brain is doing when the monkey essentially is playing a video game, controlled by the wrist in this case, to move this small cursor into one of eight targets that appear around the periphery. And so the audio you'll hear are individual clicks every time this single neuron discharges an action potential. You should hear the rate of those action potentials change over time. And see if you can figure out in which direction on this screen this neuron prefers. Where is it firing more action potentials per second? So who has a guess? Which direction on the screen does this neuron prefer? Exactly, all of you pointing to your right, down into the right. If you had enough samples, you could construct a histogram of the firing rates inside the target as the light shaded area. And a compass plot in the middle shows, on average, uh, how much uh, activity occurs during the target for this particular cell. So we call this cell directionally tuned. It prefers extension of the wrist. That's what's shown by the key here, flexion extension, a little bit of ulnar deviation down towards the, the fifth digit. 
if we're going to make a simple brain computer interface with just this one neuron, we could reduce the dimensions of the screen to just a single dimension, and we could present a visual target in the part of the screen that typically represents high rates for this cell, and another target on the other side uh, that represents low rates. And then we could ask the monkey to perform this task. The hand is no longer involved. The brain activity now smoothed with about a half second sliding window directly controls the motion of the small cursor. And we ask the animal to maintain high or low rates for a period of about two seconds. So this is the same neuron you just saw about 20 minutes later as the monkey practices this brain computer interface. So hopefully you can appreciate that the cell is firing much faster and sustaining those high rates longer. And this is really the advantage of operant conditioning or biofeedback and training the animal to control the activity of this single neuron. Now before we can test this neuron's ability to control muscle stimulation, we need a way to provide paralysis to the animal. So we actually spent several years developing a method of reversible paralysis so we could temporarily paralyze the arm. And we did that by surgically implanting catheters and cuffs around the three nerves that lead to the arm in the brachial plexus. This way, during the brain-computer interface experiments, we could painlessly infuse uh, anesthetics like lidocaine or the faster-acting derivative chloroprocaine to reversibly paralyze the arm for a period of several hours. Now the monkey's task is to use the activity of one or two neurons, as we've just seen. Convert, we convert that activity in real time to timing and magnitude of functional electrical stimulation delivered to these paralyzed muscles. And now the monkey's task is to, again, use the wrist, which is otherwise paralyzed by the nerve block, to play the computer game. And most of the experiments we did used rack-mounted equipment. And this is a picture of the rack in Ebbets' lab, where I was a postdoc when I did this work. You can see many computers, amplifiers, digitizers, stimulators. This is typical of brain-computer interface experiments. But at the time, the group was working with Jaideep Mavori and Chris Diorio when he was still in this department to realize what we call the neurochip. And this is actually the second generation neurochip. It's the one we used most often in our experiments. Um, but Jaideep uh, developed the first generation neurochip, which basically took the key components of this rack and shrunk them down to about the size of a cell phone, using largely off-the-shelf components for the version that we used in the primate. Well, there was a custom CMOS version that was used uh, in the Manduka and Tom Daniels lab. So here we have uh, amplifiers, stimulators, um, and a uh, little bit of logic to convert the activity between the two. So in this next animation, we'll see the, um, the summary of the experiment. We'll begin again with the activity from the brain directly controlling the cursor. We saw an example of that already. Once the monkeys were trained to control each individual cell, we could connect those cells to control the muscle stimulation. The neurochip shown here converted the activity in real time to proportional stimulation of the muscles. And that allowed the animal to move their wrist back and forth in a one degree of freedom task to acquire up to one of five targets. And we'll see the example of their performance next. Here's a 12 minute example of the animal performing the task. And plot time across this axis and the magnitude of the wrist torque or the amount of force they're producing on this manipulandum on this axis. There's a center target shown in gray where the monkey is required to hold the cell activity at baseline and not produce any stimulation. And then we randomly present two targets in the flexor direction and two targets in the extensor direction, requiring different levels of activity of the cell and different levels of flexor and extensor torque. You can see the animal very rapidly moves back and forth between these targets for about a period of 10 minutes. And then once every 10 minutes, we turn the stimulator off and we present the same targets and we look at how much torque the monkey can produce. And this is an important control because the nerve blocks do uh, subside over a period of hours, and the animals also develop ways to cheat the system. But in this case, uh, and in all cases that we reported, the animal was not able to produce more than 5 or 10 percent of the torque to reach that nearest target, showing that the data in between these points were sound and the animal hadn't developed another strategy to perform the task. And we looked carefully at the type of neurons that were used for this task and how they performed. And you might imagine that a directionally tuned cell, like the example we saw earlier, that one was tuned for extension, this one's tuned for flexion, would be the best choice, especially if it were connected to a muscle um, that produced movement in the same direction. 
And indeed, when we start the brain-computer interface task, these highly tuned cells, if we plot tuning strength on this axis here, uh, these highly tuned cells outperform untuned cells, and that's a statistically significant regression. However, after about 20 minutes of practice, by the time the nerve block has taken effect and we've turned on the stimulator, there's no longer any relationship between tuning strength and the animal's performance, such that a cell like this, an untuned cell, which might be active but not modulate its activity uh, for any of the targets in this task, outperforms a cell that was strongly tuned. And so there's a couple of observations here. One is that biofeedback or operant conditioning of these cells can allow you to recruit previously untuned or unrelated neurons to the task. And that's a good thing because about two-thirds of the cells that you typically record fall in this category, both in our studies and in many others. So this triples the population of useful neurons that could be used for this type of task. The other thing it does is open up the possibility of using other brain areas for this type of control which is important if we're thinking beyond spinal cord injury to users who've had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, perhaps we don't even need to be in the part of motor cortex that typically controls the hand. Perhaps we could be in somatosensory cortex if that were spared. And so Eb and I followed up with a study uh, where we typically record precentral or motor cortex neurons. We were able to move our electrodes uh, in, in one of the animals very easily to postcentral or typically somatosensory cortex and demonstrate the same. Initial performance was poor, but doubled with very brief periods of training. And really no statistical difference between neurons in motor and neurons in sensory cortex. And so that gave us the idea that perhaps we didn't even need to be uh, in these adjacent areas. Could we put our electrodes, for example, in the other hemisphere if someone had had a stroke or a traumatic injury that had damaged that entire hemisphere? And so the next study I'll tell you about describes our work using the ipsilateral cortex, or the cortex that might be spared if someone had had the most common clinical stroke, which is a middle cerebral artery occlusion, and that can damage uh, through ischemia all the areas shown in green here, which includes the hand, arm, and facial areas. So we designed a study to use uh, the ipsilateral cortex for BCI, but if you think about it, just using a uh, different hemisphere is not particularly challenging unless you uh, challenge the user to also uh, use the other hand. So if we have a typical stroke example here where this part of the brain is damaged, it affects the hand shown in gray, we can place our electrodes in the opposite cortex. We can use those for a BCI, and indeed we even use them to stimulate muscle. And as far as we could tell, the animals did just fine. There was no additional challenge to this task. The real challenge came in asking the animals to then simultaneously control the hand that's normally um, controlled by this part of cortex. So we all know that the opposite side of the brain controls the hand. And so the challenge was then asking the user to independently control both the BCI and um, the intact hand. And here you can imagine as a proxy for stimulating this muscle, we're asking one hemisphere to do double duty and effectively control both hands. As we think about what type of neurons to pick here, we might think that we could want to deliberately avoid the directionally tuned neurons, especially if those neurons are related to the ongoing movement of the intact hand. And so you might imagine that you would want to avoid these and choose untuned neurons to make this task easier. Because we know in this task, if you're asking the animals to disassociate neural activity from hand movement, there'll be some cases where that's not required and it's quite easy. If the cell firing rate increases and the, and the hand naturally moves that way, you could define what we'll call an easy diagonal here where no dissociation is required. If the opposite is true, if the cell activity has to increase but the uh, hand doesn't move, or vice versa, the hand moves but the cell is required to stay quiet, you can imagine that would be much more challenging with these directionally tuned neurons. And indeed, that's what we found. With the directionally tuned neuron, they could move rapidly and directly uh, to a target if it occurred along this easy green diagonal. But if it occurred on the hard diagonal, they had to approximate a series of easy diagonals to maintain, uh, to get to that target and maintain it. And this showed up across the population of neurons. Here we have untuned neurons. Where there's effectively no difference between the easy and hard diagonals. But with tuned neurons, you see uh, much lower performance uh, when they're asked to move in the hard diagonals. And this is work by an electrical engineering um, PhD who's now a postdoc on our lab, Ivana. Good. So we'll change gears just a little bit and talk about why we've moved our electrodes from the muscles to the spinal cord below the injury. And it has to do with improving the contractions that we're able to evoke, avoiding fatigue, 
We know that functional electrical stimulation recruits muscles generally in an inverse order. It activates the most fatigue-resistant muscle fibers first, uh, which leads to a large increase in force and rapid fatigue of those muscles. Stimulating within the spinal cord activates uh, motor neurons at least in a more natural, if not completely natural, order. So that leads to a smooth increase in force as well as fatigue-resistant contractions. And this is work of Vivian Mushoar largely in the lumbar cord of the cat. Vivian's also shown that stimulating within the lumbar cord can evoke robust synergies, stepping synergies in the hind limbs, which is where she studied. Uh, with only two electrodes per leg, she can evoke stance in one leg, swing phase in another. So if you think about it from a brain-computer interface point of view, the control signals now can be much simpler if you're able to activate functional synergies from your stimulating site. So we were eager to find out what type of activity we could evoke in the forelimb, what type of reaching or grasping activity. Would we need to activate all eight or 10 muscles required to produce this pinch grip individually, or could we find spinal stimulation sites that would give us this movement at a single site? So we initially did this study with that Betts and Steve Perlmer in the, in the cervical spinal cord of the monkey. This is an anesthetized monkey. No spinal cord injury in this case. What you should hear on the audio is the timing of the stimulator. We first use very brief uh, trains of just three pulses at 300 hertz to evoke uh, subtle contractions to map the spinal cord, and then you'll see later longer trains uh, which evoke more robust contractions. So this is a single site in the seventh cervical segment. So at the end, there was continuous stimulation. You just hear the stimulator cycling over. So from a single site, we can get what we call pinch grip, which is one of the most common tasks that people do. And in fact, it's not hard to find this. At over 70% of the sites that gave us any movement, we found at least some component of a finger and a thumb uh, grasping. So we mapped the rest of the cord. We've done this both in the non-human primate and in the rodent. Uh, we did the mapping uh, with acute electrodes that were lowered down through the spinal cord. Here, if we focus just on the half of the spinal cord, the electrode tracks are shown in gray, and we put a colored dot corresponding to the type of movement we evoked at each site that produces a movement. We can construct three-dimensional maps all the way from the third cervical segment down to the first thoracic, or C3 to T1, and you can see here that you see clusters of movements. The size of the dot corresponds to the amplitude of current that was required. Larger dots required lower current, more focal areas and perhaps easier to appreciate if you separate out the movements so that you can see the clustering of shoulder up near C3 where you'd expect it, digit movements down in the lower cord, um, as well as reflections of the wrist and, and elbow in between. Here's, yeah. So, I'm curious, is, if you move from one animal to another, how well does this mapping carry over? In the rodent, extremely well. In the monkey, hardly at all which is, could lead to a lot of speculation. The monkey has a lot more descending fibers from the brain to the spinal cord, and so it's thought that these electrodes activate those fibers of passage and may recruit then more heterogeneous networks in the monkey. So I assume the same thing applies to humans. Yeah, no one knows yet. No one's done the cervical, intraspinal cervical study in humans. Starting to do epidural, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Very good question. Here's two examples of um, the types of movements that we see in our rodent. Uh, the first is an example of extension of the elbow. You can think of this as a reaching movement. We show three different stimulus intensities here, so small, medium, and large uh, extension of the arm. And this is an example of the grading of force that you can get with interspinal microstimulation. Functional electrical stimulation is much trickier to get uh, smooth movements. You typically get on and off contractions. Um, and at any of the sites shown in the color here, we can evoke that uh, movement. Here's an example of flexion of the wrist and digits. So you can think of this as a grasping movement. Uh, just one stimulus current shown here, so it's that same movement over and over again on all the yellow sites. But now you could imagine with just two sites, you could effectively get a reach and a grasp, as opposed to needing to instrument many muscles if you stimulate the muscles directly. So the next step was to perform a clinically realistic injury for these animals. So we chose a contusion injury, which is a bruise to the spinal cord. It's centered on the fourth cervical segment, but you see spreading of the cyst across several adjacent segments as well as secondary demyelination of the white matter. 
And this type of injury compared to a pre-injury uh, use where the forelimbs are used approximately equally, you see a dramatic change in just one of the forelimbs that persists over six, nine, and even up to 12 weeks in some of these studies. So now that we have injured animals, we can proceed to close the loop and connect this brain activity to stimulate the spinal cord below the lesion. There were two steps here. The first was refining Vivian Mushwar's technique for intraspinal microstimulation to adapt it to the cervical cord, adapt it to the rodents. Mike Caston led that charge in the lab. Um, we're now able to implant six or more wires below the level of the injury into the motor pools that give us these robust reaching type movements. We're also recording activity from the brain, activity that's indicative of the type of movement that the animal might be planning to make. Here's just three examples of different neurons in the brain that correspond to different aspects of this lever pressing task, which we'll show you in a moment, was the task we used to study this reanimation. This first neuron builds up activity gradually as the animal lifts its arm before making contact with the lever, shown by the red line. The next neuron bursts very briefly at the time when the lever contact is first made. And the third neuron uh, is active during the whole time that the lever is held depressed, indicated by the gray region. So we have cortical signals now that indicate different aspects of this movement. And so we can close the loop now um, by connecting the brain activity to the spinal stimulation. First video, the stimulator's off. You just hear the neuron, it's the popping sound of the neuron. You can see that the animal is unable to depress the lever more than just a very gentle tap. In the second clip, we close the loop and trigger stimulation based on this neuron. Good. We'll play it again uh, more slowly. I think the audio is off for the second part so that you can appreciate the deficits at first. The injured forelimb is the one facing you. You can see she's unable to support weight, unable to extend the limb, open the hand, and press the lever. You can see she collapses a little bit on that side, uh, unable to bear weight on that injured limb as well. And then you'll see when the stimulator comes on here, she's actually activating the stimulator as she's walking around the cage as well. There'll be stimulation there indicated by the light. Um, it slips along the floor a bit, but you'll see she's both weight bearing and pressing um, with that hand. Just one other thing to point out, because it's something we're working on actively. You'll see cables leaving the head from the um, leading up to the rack mounted system. And that's something we're working on eliminating in collaboration with Josh Smith's team. So just a quick bit of summary data. Um, stills from the video showing the degree of maximum uh, depression of the lever in the two cases. You'll see the trajectory over time here. When the stimulator is turned on, animal robustly depresses the lever. Uh, when the stimulator is off, animal is not able to deflect the lever. And this is Iva Ivan's thesis work. She's a neuroscience graduate student in the lab. So I mentioned before that these cables are cumbersome. We're using rack-mounted equipment. Everything has percutaneous connectors. And so in collaboration with Josh Smith and Adrian Fairhall, we've been funded to develop an implantable system which could close this loop and connect this brain activity to spinal stimulation. Some of the key components here, as well as, well as wireless power and data, which Josh is already starting to demonstrate, um, is can you decode the intention of the animal on implanted computing? And so Adrienne Fairhall is contributing, and her students are contributing algorithms, such as the generalized linear model, which might be fit outside the body, but then those filter coefficients could be loaded onto such a computer. Uh, because here, rather than being power limited, Josh is able to pass plenty of power through the skin, we're actually heat dissipation limited. How much heat can we dissipate under the skin? The FDA says no more than two degrees C if it's away from the central nervous system, and no more than one degree C if you're on the brain or the spinal cord. So that's become a key challenge here. In this diagram, we also show um, some circuits that bypass the injury. This is the model of our injury here, lateralized to affect the descending tracks. Uh, there are circuits that are spared. They may or may not be connected, but an intriguing possibility is that the operation of this type of circuit, recording from the brain, stimulating the spinal cord, may actually strengthen synaptic connections bypassing this injury. I don't have time to talk about it, but Ebbets has shown nice examples in the uninjured animal of being able to strengthen this circuit um, using timing-dependent stimulation. I want to spend the next section of the talk talking about how spinal stimulation alone can affect the local excitability of these circuits and lead to long-term improvements in reaching. So it was originally designed as a control experiment for our closed loop stimulation. We just stimulated the spinal cord in an open loop fashion and examined the type of recovery that occurred. 
The study was designed like this. In this case, we're using a precision forelimb reaching task rather than a lever pressing task because it requires cortical spinal activation. It's a little bit more precise, a little easier to gauge improvement. Um, it's also a challenging task for the animals to learn. Once the animals were trained on this task, they received that same lateralized contusion injury that we described earlier. And then we used our neurochip device to deliver that open loop stimulation to a randomized group of animals, about 11 in each group, um, for seven hours a day for 12 weeks. I can see the animals here again with the neurochips set up above each animal, uh, cables running to each animal. All these things could be improved with implantable um, devices. And the same diagram of the spinal stimulation wires were used uh, below the injury. So here's a video of two animals at the conclusion of the study. The first animal was not stimulated for the duration of the 12 weeks, other than very brief pulses, just to test that the electrodes were in place. Um, and you can see this animal's reaching ability. And in this case, all data are shown with the stimulator disconnected. So there's no cable on the animal's head. They're not being stimulated. And you can appreciate that this animal's unable to reach through the slit in the plexiglass, unable to grasp that food pellet. Second pellet is just to keep her interested, because she would otherwise lose motivation. Here's a stimulated animal after 12 weeks, able to easily extend and reach the food pellet, exhibits much less of that flexor tone, spasticity that we see after injury. Not a perfect performance. She stumbles a little bit on the way back into the cage, but much better at retrieving the food pellets. And this is held up across the group of 11 animals, animals who were stimulated for 12 weeks, outperforming unstimulated animals. And in one case, we had the opportunity to observe an animal whose implant failed partway through the study. So she received stimulation for the first five and a half weeks, and then implant failure occurred here at the beginning of the gray bar, and we just followed her out for the additional six weeks. And we see a nice sustained recovery compared to her paired animal in the unstimulated control condition. We can look mechanistically at what our stimulator activated and how that mapped to improvements. As you've seen in the video so far, we get the most robust effect is extension of the elbow. It's the most common thing we get, especially after injury. And extension of the digits is actually something we see growing over time if we compare weeks one, six, and 12 of treatment. And those map quite nicely onto the improvements that we see in um, function during this task. So the animal's ability to advance the limb and extend the digits are some of the, the measures that were significantly improved after stimulation. You can appreciate that in the, in the photographs here. Stimulated animals extending the, animal, extending the limb, opening the hand, compared to unstimulated animals, which exhibit that clinically realistic flexor pattern. Good. In the last few minutes of the talk, I want to talk about two uh, ongoing studies and planned studies um, that aim to transition some of these uh, observations we've had about spinal stimulation having therapeutic effects, brain-controlled spinal stimulation, and also expand our bio devices to other applications. So the first study here is really work that we're doing at the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, so I'll leave the, um, the flag up there for them. And this is work that started in Howard Chiswick's lab using the Medtronic Activa system, but we're now planning to adapt that to the spinal cord. So stimulation on the surface of the spinal cord is commonly used to treat chronic pain. There's several hundred thousand of these devices implanted. Um, so they're FDA approved device. And recently, there's been a number of studies using this epidural stimulation off label to treat spinal cord injury. We've seen very dramatic effects. Individuals who are otherwise completely paralyzed while they're receiving the epidural stimulation in conjunction with some physical therapy, are able to move limbs that they weren't able to move before. And excitingly, after the fact, they improve bladder function, bowel function, sexual function, many other autonomic functions that persist beyond the stimulation. Almost all that work has been done in the lumbar spinal cord to look at movement of the legs. And we're proposing to do this in the cervical spinal cord. And our innovation is to not just stimulate the spinal cord continuously, which is what has been done to date, but to make the stimulation activity dependent. And the easiest way to do that is to leverage the work that Jeffrey Heron and Howard have already done using an inertial measurement unit wristwatch to trigger the implanted Activa stimulator to deliver that activity when the user, for example, attempts to use their hand or begins to use their hand. And here we're talking about a population with incomplete spinal cord injury, people with cervical myelopathy. They're already undergoing surgery for decompression of the cord, so it reduces the additional risk of implanting the stimulator. And they can attempt movements or cause movements, but they're very weak or incomplete. So a future direction of this work is a collaboration with Jeff Lang at MIT, who's also part of our center, to use his transmission line glove, which is an enhanced data glove, which can digitize the positions of the fingers, 
to detect the beginnings of these grass movements, be it a pinch synergy or a power grip, and use that to coordinate different patterns of stimulation on the spinal cord that might be enabling, that might enable them to complete those grasps. So activity-dependent stimulation, looking at both the direct effect and reanimation and also the therapeutic effect. Now our long-term vision is to combine this approach with activity uh, extracted directly from the brain, especially for people who are completely paralyzed. And again, this leverages ongoing work that Howard's lab is doing, where they've implanted subjects with deep brain stimulators, but also placed surface electrodes on the surface of the brain, electrocorticography electrodes, to test both the stability of these electrodes over time, and also the user's ability to control a brain-computer interface, in this case, even with only a four-channel system. Obviously, Medtronic and others are working on scaling up the channel count. Uh, we've seen examples earlier with Jeff Ogeman's team with 64 electrodes. You can reliably extract uh, these grasp synergies, so somewhere in between will probably be needed. But the goal is to use these FDA-approved devices so that we can more readily connect the brain to the spinal cord and do this under an investigational device exemption, or an IDE, as opposed to needing to go through the regulatory hurdles of approving our own device. Of course, in parallel, we're also collaborating with many um, groups in this department to develop custom electronics. Part of those efforts are through the CSNE. Um, part of them are also funded by um, drug companies like GlaxoSmithKline, who think that the drug pipeline is drying up and that they need to in invest in bioelectronic medicines or more targeted ways to read, write, and block the activity of visceral nerves. And so our particular um, model system here is the bladder. Can we build a device that can record the activity coming from the spinal cord to the bladder? Can it stimulate and cause activity, cause contractions of the bladder on command, and can it block activity? And we're using a hybrid approach where we combine both electrical recording and stimulation as well as optical stimulation. Here taking advantage of the technique known as optogenetics, where we virally transfect the bladder um, with light-sensitive channels that are expressed in the nerves, such that when we shine light on the nerves, even though this is a mixed nerve flowing to not only the bladder, but the colon and many other targets, we can selectively activate just the nerves that innervate the bladder and using different colors of light for activation and for blocking. So here's an example, an early example that this works. This is Tom Richner's work, a bioengineering postdoc in the lab. Um, after transfecting animals with an AAV, an adenovirus, uh, expressing channel rhodopsin, abbreviated CHR2, you see after light stimulation, re very repeatable contractions of the bladder. Uh, it's smooth muscles, so they evolve very slowly as they do after electrical stimulation. And compared to a naive control that did not um, receive the channel rhodopsin, you see no effect effectively of the light stimulation. And probably the best part about this light stimulation is that there are very few off-target effects. So if we simultaneously record colon pressure, um, which is another organ that's innervated by this nerve, we can pulse the light at each of the blue dots here. We see the bladder pressure respond and no appreciable change in colon pressure. So very selective activation. Now teaming up with Josh Smith's lab, we've also built a device that is fully implantable that can perform these functions. The prototype is about a fourth generation prototype shown here, um, meant to perform all the functions that are illustrated in the diagram above, capturing wireless power, transmitting wireless data, um, current drivers that can multiplex to both electrical electrodes as well as LEDs for light stimulation. We're using off the shelf uh, neural recording amplifiers, the Intan chip for this particular iteration. Um, and as yet, the logic is not on these devices because in terms of the, the challenge that we're solving, we can actually do some of that logic outside the animal. But the long-term goal, as we talked about with the spinal stimulation, is to actually do some of that decoding and control on board the animal. Here's an example of um, that device implanted in one of our animals. Um, first, Josh's team powered the device at a range of about five centimeters. They were able to pass 300 milliwatts. Uh, to charge up a supercapacitor on the device. And then we subsequently let the device run here, just illuminating a blue LED as a cute example. It can also perform the other functions. And the only wire crossing the skin here is to a thermocouple to measure the temperature. And so we were excited to report that the temperature here increased by no more than half a degree C uh, throughout the whole charging and um, use phase, which is well within those FDA limits that I mentioned earlier. Even one degree C would be appropriate for brain or spinal applications.
So I'm excited to continue collaborating with Josh and with others uh, to push these devices. This is also part of the CSNE platform to miniaturize this device to gradually move from off the shelf components such as the Intan to uh, custom CMOS components, eventually all to a single chip solution. So we'll just conclude uh, with the points that we hit today. We saw first that monkeys could use arbitrary neurons um, in either hemisphere to control a brain-computer interface, and in some cases, muscle stimulation. And so we're excited about this because we feel like to translate these technologies out of the lab and into the clinic, we're gonna need to be able to assist more than just people with spinal cord injury, which are fortunately a relatively small population. We're gonna need to help users post-stroke, post-traumatic brain injury, and so this is the, one of the first examples showing that a brain-computer interface can be used for other populations. We then spent some time talking about spinal stimulation, both its advantages of evoking these robust synergies, fatigue-resistant contractions, and also the way that the spinal cord is a self-organizing unit. And so as we record activity from the brain and aim to reanimate the spinal cord, we may be saving ourselves a lot of computation if we can leverage the spinal synergies that are evoked as opposed to having to time the individual stimulation to the muscles. And then finally, we talked about the long-term benefits of spinal stimulation. Even after stimulation, these animals show improvement, and the same is starting to hold true for human subjects with epidural stimulation. There's a therapeutic benefit of electrically activating these spinal cords. And so it's a very exciting topic in the field right now, and we're quite excited to contribute um, to see whether bio devices can interact both with the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system to improve function. Obviously, a lot of things I talked about were a huge team effort. The first few studies were done when I was a postdoc in Epfetz's lab. Uh, many other collaborating faculty listed here. I want to just point out a few people uh, who I didn't have time to mention. Charlie Matlack was an EE graduate student that worked with Howard and I, designed a lot of the brain-computer interface tasks that we talked about in the stroke study. Uh, Jaidi Bavori, we talked about already. Tim Morrison was a grad student with Brian Otis, contributed to some of our early work there. And David Bionis is a current uh, EE grad student working in the lab. So, and of course, all the funding agencies that have supported our lab over the last several years. And um, we'll thank them, and I'll also thank you for your attention while we're uh, happy to take any questions. Any questions for Chet? Go, Chris. Chris has one. likewise in the spinal cord, as you had done in that one example. Um, if you say that it's quite different when you move from animal to animal, or presumably from person to person to person, I mean, I guess, would that be a, a big area of research to, to go in and very quickly map on an individual level the, the, sort of the personality, the neural personality of, a, of an individual? Yeah, I think, I think it'll be required, especially in the primates and in the human subjects that during surgery or shortly after surgery, you uh, map the output effects of the electrodes that you have, um, and probably be required on the smaller animals as well, just to assure that even the variability of electrode placement is accounted for. I don't think it's a showstopper. The fact that all these monkeys looked a little bit different, they still had the same movements, they just appeared in slightly different places. So, so in that example that you showed there, how long did that, that take? I mean, are, are, how quickly do you think that could be done you know, in sure. the future? Sure, so intraoperative mapping might be a little bit of a challenge if you're meaning to replace your electrodes in just the right spots. Vivian Mouchoir has a very nice method in the lumbar cord where she searches around until she finds a landmark, which is the division between flexors and extensors of the leg. Once she finds that site, the rest of the sites map out pretty well. The way that it's being done in the current human trials is to implant an electrode that has more sites than you need on the surface of the spinal cord, and then after surgery, you have plenty of time to go through and test all the pairs and all the combinations. So it's still a little bit labor intensive, but it allows you also to optimize the stimulation. So I think it's all overcomable, but it was interesting to notice the difference between the animal species and that some were very repeatable and some were highly variable. So the challenge really is more right now the mapping itself. Right? Yeah, it's I don't think the mapping is a challenge, it's just something that would need to be done. So in every animal we found this movement, at many places we found synergies of reach and grasp at many places, upwards of 70% of the sites we tried. So it's not hard to find the site, you just wouldn't know a priori if I put an electrode here what exactly I'm gonna get. Other questions? Lee. Uh, 
viral delivery and uh, genetic modification? Sure. So there's definitely caution warranted, but I will tell you that there's already a study in the United States approved by the FDA using optogenetics with this exact virus, the AV virus. It's injected into the eye for people with blindness due to retinitis pigmentosa. So the eye is a nice model because it's relatively contained. But there is also a study in the UK in the same model. And the AAV virus is being used for gene therapy quite, quite broadly. Uh, children with developmental disabilities, gene replacement therapy. Um, so the virus is now FDA approved. And the light sensitive channels, the additional concern, of course, that you would have, if it was expressed in the brain or somewhere else, would be stray light, scattered light affecting those channels. And so that's something that'll have to be looked at closely. But certainly, people have, have worried quite a bit about viral transduction and things, but the, the FDA has approved it now. It's moving through safety and efficacy studies, and so I think it's just a matter of time until we see it in all these different applications, obviously with the modicum of safety. Other questions? Sure, yeah, so most of the data that I showed directly were single neurons. Some of the data I alluded to from Raj and, and Jeff Ogeman were uh, populations of neurons from the electrocorticography from the surface. Uh, and certainly there's other data emerging from imaging, uh, calcium imaging on the surface of the brain shows very robust patterns, and all the way to the surface of the scalp. Electroencephalography will also give you information about what's happening underneath. So I think there's many different scales that we could use to extract the information about the intention to move. Some of that is going to be driven by how detailed we need the information to be. Some of it's going to be driven by how much the user will tolerate in terms of an invasive surgery. So if you can get individual neurons, then you get the most information from those. But that's a challenge, because the um, tissue tends to respond to those electrodes over a period of years. So all the data that I showed you from the Pittsburgh group and the Brown group, those electrodes eventually fail after a period of one to five years and need to be explanted. The electrocorticography data, we don't know. Howard's actually getting probably some of the first long-term data on that, how much scar tissue will affect the signal quality. Hopefully a lot less, because the frequency patterns are a lot lower that we're interested in. And so those high-frequency signals tend to go away when the glial sheath encapsulates the electrodes. Hopefully the lower frequencies, up to about 100 or 200 hertz, a high gamma, may be preserved even if there's a, a gliosis that forms between the brain and the electrode. So somewhere in there is probably the sweet spot. I would say electrocorticography can give you very good information about certain things, a P300, a, a surprise response on a computer screen maybe one or two degrees of freedom, but it might be challenging to extract these high degree of freedom. We're talking about 22 degrees of freedom maybe in the hand and arm. So can you extract that from EEG? At the moment, I don't think so, but perhaps with advanced techniques uh, that could happen. So I think somewhere in between EEG and penetrating electrodes is probably the sweet spot. Uh, how consistent, whenever there is a stimulus, how consistent the brain wave produce the signal? So um, some of the data showed are obviously averaged over multiple sweeps, and there are individual variations in whether a given cell will fire. And most of the studies, we were unique in using individual neurons to fire these um, muscle stimulators. Most of the studies use a population of activity and use something like a Kalman filter to smooth that activity and predict there. Because if one cell doesn't fire in a given trial, the other one likely will. So generally, you need to look at least at a slightly broader set of activity for reliability because you do see some some run to run variability in the brain activity. Chad, I have I have a yeah. question for you. We have a population of double E students and if, sure. if some of them are interested in in uh, working in this kind of area of neuroengineering, what what are the challenges for uh, double E's in, in working uh, in this area? Sure, that's a great question, Matt. So one of them is uh, the electro tissue interface, as I mentioned. So any kind of uh, nanomaterial, MEMS advances to get these, um, these uh, implanted devices very small. We know that the body doesn't react to s electrodes that are less than 10 microns in diameter. So the challenge of how do you get something that's long and thin and 10 microns into the brain is one thing that could definitely use some help, and there are many ways to approach that. People have tried. Uh, another challenge, as I mentioned, is this idea of efficient computing. Can you do very low power computing on an implanted device? And with heat dissipation being your limiting factor, not necessarily wireless powering. So that's another one. And then the entire integration, we know that the more components we can put on custom silicon, if we can build a single IC that can perform all these functions, power budgets go way down, size goes way down. 
and all the tethering forces and things that we worry about when we run wires from the brain out to even an implanted device, but something that lives in the skull or on the, uh, in the chest, as many of these commercial devices do. Uh, if you could actually implant your amplifier right on the back of your recording electrode, and then you've removed the movement artifacts that you get uh, as the cable moves between the brain. The brain is always jiggling and pulsating, so you've removed some of that. Um, so I think those are three key areas, but I'm happy to discuss more as well. I think there's, it's a rich area for, uh, for EEs to contribute. Thanks. Great. Well, with that, thank you very much, uh, Chet, for speaking to us.